Reading from the Acts of the Apostles After Jesus had ascended into heaven, the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives, which is near Jerusalem, about a kilometer away. They entered the city and went up to the upper room where they had been staying. There were Peter and John, James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James son of Alphaeus, Simon the Zealot and Judah son of James. They all devoted themselves to prayer together, along with some women, including Mary the mother of Jesus, and with Jesus' brothers. The Word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Proclamation of the Gospel of Jesus Christ according to St. Luke. Glory to you, Lord. At that time the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph. He was a descendant of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. The angel came to her and said, Rejoice, you who are highly favored, the Lord is with you. Mary was troubled by this and began to wonder what kind of greeting this might be. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Behold, you will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. Mary asked the angel, How can this be, since I have no relations with a man? The angel answered, The Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the Holy Child to be born will be called the Son of God. Even your relative Elizabeth has conceived a son in her old age. This is the sixth month for her who was said to be barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Behold, I am the handmaid of the Lord, let it be done to me according to your word. And the angel departed. The word of the Savior. Glory to you, Lord. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, let us imagine for a moment a silent room, filled with the tension of expectation. In it, a diverse group of people, men and women young and old, are united in common purpose, their hearts beating in unison in fervent prayer. This scene, described in our first reading from the Book of the Acts of the Apostles, transports us to a crucial moment in the history of the early church. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet. All these with one accord devoted themselves to prayer, along with some women and Mary the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. This is not a triumphant return. Jesus has just ascended into heaven, leaving his followers with a promise and a mission. We can imagine the mix of emotions, joy at the glory of their Lord, apprehension about the uncertain future, anticipation of the promised comforter. And in the midst of it all, they turn to prayer. Note the composition of this group, the apostles, certainly, but also some women and Jesus' brothers. This is a powerful image of the church in its purest and most essential form, a diverse community, united not by ties of blood or social status, but by the common bond of faith in Christ and the practice of prayer. And at the center of this praying community is Mary, the mother of Jesus. Her presence leads us naturally to our gospel reading, where Luke transports us back in time to the moment when it all began, the Annunciation. The angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. What a contrast to the scene in Jerusalem. Here we have not a community, but a solitary young woman. Not a seasoned group of followers of Christ, but a virgin not yet touched by the extraordinary events that would shape salvation history. And yet there is a profound continuity between these two scenes, embodied in the person of Mary. The angel greets Mary with words that have echoed down the centuries, Hail, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Mary, understandably, is disturbed. Who would not be in the face of such an apparition, such a greeting? But it is Mary's response that sets the tone for everything that will follow, not only in her life but in the life of the church. Behold, I am the handmaid of the Lord, let it be done to me according to your word. This yes of Mary is the perfect model of responding to God's call. It is a yes given in faith, 
without fully understanding all the implications. It is a yes that echoes the Amen of creation to God's creative word. It is a yes that opens the door to the incarnation of the divine word. Now let us return to the scene in Jerusalem. The same Mary who said yes to God's plan in Nazareth is now at the center of the nascent church, persevering in prayer. She has experienced the joy of Jesus' birth, the pain of seeing him crucified, the glory of his resurrection, and now the separation of his ascension. Through it all, Mary has remained faithful, her initial yes unfolding into a life of fidelity and service. What do these two readings, decades apart, teach us today? First, they remind us of the centrality of prayer in the Christian life. Both in the intimacy of the personal encounter with God, represented by the Annunciation, and in the community of the faithful in Jerusalem, prayer is the guiding thread. It is through prayer that we open ourselves to God's will, that we find strength for our journey of faith, that we come together as the body of Christ. Second, these readings call us to radical availability to God's plan. Mary's yes was not a one-time event, but the beginning of a life of surrender. Likewise, we are called to say yes to God not just once, but every day, in every circumstance of our lives. Third, we see the importance of community in the journey of faith. Mary was not alone in Jerusalem, she was surrounded by a community of faith. Likewise, we are not called to live our faith in isolation, but in communion with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Fourth, these readings remind us that faith often takes us to unexpected places. Mary could not have foreseen, that day in Nazareth, that she would be at the center of the nascent church in Jerusalem. Yet she remained faithful every step of the way. We are called to have the same fidelity, trusting that God will guide us even when the path is not clear. Finally, these readings show us Mary's special role in the history of salvation and in the life of the church. She is not only the mother of Jesus, but also our spiritual mother, a model of faith and discipleship for all of us. My dear brothers and sisters, today we are invited to follow Mary's example. We are called to say yes to God, even when his plan seems incomprehensible or frightening. We are called to persevere in prayer, both individually and as a community. We are called to be open to the action of the Holy Spirit in our lives, allowing him to transform us and use us for his glory. Let us imagine for a moment what it would be like if each of us lived with the same openness as Mary, with the same perseverance in prayer as the first disciples. How our families would be transformed. How our parish would be invigorated. How our world would be different. May we, like Mary, say, Behold the servant of the Lord in every circumstance of our lives. May we, like the first disciples, persevere with one accord in prayer. And may the Holy Spirit, who descended upon Mary in Nazareth and upon the disciples at Pentecost, descend upon us as well, empowering us to be faithful witnesses of Christ in our world. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. St. Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl throughout the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen.